Uh, and of course, and of course, the, the subsequent stay that was issued in federal court. So we'll be able to address all that uh, here this morning. Uh, my name is Tom Moniz. I'm an attorney and shareholder with uh, Von Briesen Law Firm. Uh, and as a lifelong resident of Fond du Lac County and as a member of the Envision Advocacy Committee, I know how important uh, you know, workforce stability is for our Fond du Lac County businesses. And, and so I know that you know, how the recent issues swirling around the, the vaccine mandates have really taken center stage for a lot of you. Uh, and a lot of our, our fellow businesses. So this morning, I, I'm really delighted to, to be here and introduce two of my colleagues who have been monitoring this from the front lines, really. Um, Dan Samandel is a member of the Compensation and Benefits, uh, ERISA and Labor and Employment sections at our firm. Dan assists employers in creating workplaces that optimize operations and, and benefits the workforce by taking really a proactive approach to policy development um, and implementation to ensure that employers are covered and employees are never taken by surprise. Um, so, so Dan's areas of, of expertise revolve around labor and employment matters with regard to OSHA, ADA, ERISA, the Affordable Care Act, family and medical leave, uh, et cetera. And, and of course, uh, most recently, uh, the vaccine mandates as, the re as they relate to those workplace issues. Um, Nick Probst is also joining us. Uh, Nick, I, I'm, I'm really happy that he's here today. He's a shareholder in our government law group, and he also is chair of our government relations section, where as an attorney and a registered Wisconsin lobbyist, he's got experience in both public and private sector law, public policy, consulting, government administration, business development. Um, so at, he's really kind of in tune with the, the political and legislative aspects of what's going on with this thing. Uh, prior to joining uh, our law firm, Nick was vice president at a Wisconsin government relations firm where he represented clients on a, a, a variety of issues ranging from healthcare and infrastructure to emerging technology, economic development. And so his services include you know, direct lobbying, develop and implementing political action strategies, building coalitions and, and analyzing policy and, and legislative uh, issues. So with that, uh, I'll step back and I'd like to turn it over to Nick to really kick things off and kind of talk about an update as to what's been happening in the courts and, and legislatively since these regulations came down from OSHA and, and CMS. So Nick. All right, well, hey, thanks, Tom. and. Uh... Uh, good morning to everyone. This is, uh, I'm, I'm sure, for some of you, uh, uh, you know, th this is this is a front the front burner issue as as you're facing a, a oper operational implementation of of something you you've not had to do before. Um, this has been a a hot button issue, as as Tom mentioned, with some of our uh, uh, government relations clients, our our legal clients want more information on this. So happy to get in front of you. All today and kind of share what share what we know and and then we'll open it up for, for questions. Um, big picture, as as you all know, this this uh, the OSHA ETS has um, been stayed by the courts. Really, the where we're at right now is we we are we are in a very crucial point in the next two weeks where we're going to find out if the Sixth Circuit is going to. Uh, continue to stay or, or if, if, if they're not. And really, you know, what, what happened there was the, um, we had a multi-jurisdictional uh, lottery really with all the, all, the, all the cases, all the, all the petitions and all, and all the uh, uh, different circuits were, were put into a lottery. What came out was the fifth circuit. So the, uh, or excuse me, the sixth circuit. So they're gonna decide they've consolidated the challenges and all the different circuits circuits into the into the sixth circuit and there's several there's several motions but before the court there is uh for instance um two two things there's there's a uh, right now it would proceed under a three judge panel is is how it would how it would, how it would generally proceed there's a there's a motion to proceed uh in bank which would uh, have it before the entire Sixth Circuit. Uh, there's also uh, there's also a, a motion for an expedited briefing schedule as well. So we'll see how those things shake out. But the, the thing that we're really keeping our eye on is whether the current stay is upheld or not. That will give from the from the, some of the attorneys that are, that are working on 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 this 
right now. It's my understanding that that will be very, very indicative of how this will probably how this will probably go. Depending on how that how that goes, if the stay is upheld, you would expect OSHA to immediately ap appeal to the Supreme Court. If it's not, you'd expect the uh, petitioners to to appeal to the, the Supreme Court. So we would expect that within the next one to two weeks, a decision on that. And obviously, there's a pretty compressed timeline with this this rule uh, in getting getting this uh, straightened out before I believe and Dan will have the the, the exact dates on, on when we expect things to happen. But we're ex I would we would expect to see within the next two weeks a decision out of the Sixth Circuit on the stay, and that will be that would be pretty insightful as to to what might happen moving forward. But uh, we were we were joking a little bit on uh, before everyone logged on um, about about making predictions about what's going to happen. And it, it's pretty. I think it's pretty tough at this time to to make a, an accurate prediction. We are we're kind of in the uh, uh, the crucial period here of a couple of weeks, and we're going to see what the first actions at the sixth district takes. Um, so that's uh, br bringing that back to Wisconsin and and uh, of Wisconsin perspective. Wisconsin Institute of Law and Liberty uh, did did file in the Seventh Circuit, and they were part of the what was consolidated into that Sixth Circuit um, where we are now. Uh, they have a they of course have a motion to stay that was never acted on in the Seventh Circuit because it was consolidated, but just as an update on what what kind of action was being brought um, from the state of Wisconsin that that was uh, will was uh, a primary and publicized uh, challenger to the OSHA rule. Um, the other, so that's that's kind of the the big picture where we are with with that right now. Uh, one other note I would make, I know it would, popped around the news, was the CMS. I don't know if we have any healthcare related folks on the call. Uh, the CMS uh, uh, mandate was was struck, but it was on, or was stayed, but it was only for the states that challenged. There was not a challenge from Wisconsin, but uh, it's I, I suppose anticipated that since the the states where a challenge was brought that CMS rule was was stayed, that there may be more states uh, getting involved in, in filing a challenge on that because they, they saw that that it was successful in the short term. So that's that's uh, kind of the big picture from the court action. And just from your, you know, because this is a, a Chamber of Commerce, I'm sure many of you have uh, relationships or, or go to WMC events. Um, the uh, just in to give you an idea of what the, the picture looks like from an association or a chamber perspective, uh, WMC uh, put out a put out a statement, you know, opposed to the opposed to the mandate. Uh, they say that the the ETS will place undue and unfair burdens on the business community uh, that have already gone through great lengths and expense to uh, uh, battle the the COVID issues within their work and create work safe workplaces. So uh, you had WMC out opposed to it. On the other side of things, you had some of the national associations. You had uh, some of the bigger national associations uh, were supportive of, of, the, of the ETS and you know, felt that this was a, a needed, uh, needed measure. So a little, little bit of a difference of opinion between uh, a group you might work with at the state level and some groups that maybe some of you work with at, at, at a national level. So if you have any other questions or, or on that point, I can, I'd be happy to uh, check into which, which groups uh, came down on, on which side of this, but it doesn't seem to really have much impact other than this is going through the courts right now. Um, and then, uh, you know, lastly, I would, I would also describe the, what you might see on the news. You've seen Florida, Texas, some other states, primarily Republican, uh, full Republican control states that have taken some state action to uh, preempt or, or to block the implementation of, of the OSHA ETS. Now, for those of you that see that on the news, I would say, you know, in the state of Wisconsin, that is extremely unlikely, even if the, even if the legislature here were to move forward with something that uh, protected personal information on your vaccination status, uh, try to create its own safety standards that in on a federalism type uh, theory that that would that would preempt uh, OSHA. 
uh, it's not going to happen in Wisconsin. It would be my opinion. You've got a split. You've got split government here. You have a Republican legislature. You have uh, a, a Democratic governor, Tony Evers. Uh, I couldn't imagine he would sign anything that would come through the Republican legislature. Uh, if you remember backing up, and this is a long time ago now, March of 2020, uh, it was very difficult for the governor and, and the legislature to get on the same page. I have not seen the Republican legislature in Wisconsin push forward anything challenging this. It's been pretty quiet. WMC has been the most vocal uh, player in the political field. So, you know, I, I think the biggest thing that we're going to keep our keep our eye on is is the proceedings in the uh, in the courts, and that will kind of inform what uh, where we're at uh, for our, in the business community in Wisconsin. Um, that being said, if there's any uh, any questions on that point or any of those points on the on the big picture, I'd be happy to turn it over to. Uh, I'll take those now or at the end. Uh, otherwise, I turn it over to Dan for uh, just kind of a presentation on what. What, what this really means, what the rule means for, uh, for employers in the state. Awesome, thanks Nick, I appreciate it. I'm gonna attempt to share my screen here and regardless of how many times I do technology, it always messes up somehow. So bear with me one second. Can you see me? All good, perfect, it worked. I'm load this up. Okay, still good? Perfect, thanks, Joe. <laughs> All right, so as Nick has already explained, we have certainty up to our ears here. Everything makes perfect sense. There's no problems. Everyone knows what's going on. Um, obviously, we have a little bit of doubt and uncertainty going on. And even though we have these challenges to the OSHA ETS rule, Right now, until all of that's resolved, what we're recommending is really to stay focused in preparation for something to come through. Because the worst thing that we can have happen at this juncture is to have this rule come through passed with flying colors and we're suddenly on the back burner reacting rather than being ahead of the curb and being able to communicate and keep up with the OSHA rules as they're currently administered. Because as Nick had, um, discussed a little earlier, there are a couple of key deadlines, a couple of fast approaching deadlines that we need to be cognizant of as we move forward. And it's best to get ahead of that before this, this ruling comes down, because as I mentioned there, um, OSHA is not playing around with this. Um, President Biden is taking this very, very aggressively as well. I mean, every single day, there's an update as far as what this rule is going to say. There, I mean, the, the White House is doubling down on it. And there's been communication besides some of the more pressing things on where OSHA is going to, whether this is going to pass. The White House is already talking about expanding this beyond 100 employers and, and minimizing it or broadening it, excuse me, to small employers. So really any employer at this juncture should be taking a very serious look at their COVID policies and a potential for a vaccine mandate with testing alternatives. And I say it that way, even though the rule is set up a little bit differently, because I know a lot of you have probably already viewed this and kind of understand how this rule is approached, but it really is a vaccine mandate. The testing alternatives are far less um, the focus. The vaccine is really what people are pushing or what, the, what OSHA is pushing. And so we're going to start today talking about what the actual rule is. We're going to talk about what expectations there are, obligations for employers, um, different policy requirements, paid leave opportunities that are required under the rule, everything you need to know to at least have it on, in front of you on the table to say, how do we move forward? How do we discuss strategy to ensure that we can keep up and be proactive with this despite all the uncertainty that's floating around this rule? I'll very briefly mention the CMS interim rule, and I'm actually just gonna do it now because the, I'm gonna focus on the OSHA ETS rule for private employers over hundred. That's the big one that we're talking about. That's the one that Nick was discussing in his, that's been stayed. We have the CMS rule, we have a federal contractor rule. There are other options depending on your industry, but today I'm gonna to be focusing on the OSHA rule because this is the most widely applicable. The other ones are for health, um, health um, facilities, 
federal contractors, obviously that's self-explanatory, but this one is all private employers, potentially public, but again, it could even broaden from where it currently stands, depending on what we get from the courts. I'll also talk about accommodation considerations after some of these rules are in place. What do we have to do for people that don't want to do either? Do we have to do anything? We're going to talk about some of those options. And finally, we're going to talk about policy because I wouldn't be a lawyer if I wasn't talking to you about some sort of documentation and policy development that's written and formally articulated, blah, 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 blah. But it's an important characteristic of it, and it's a requirement of the law or of the OSHA rule that needs to be in place. So the OSHA emergency temporary standard, I'm not going to go into some of the background on this, but one key point to this is this second bullet. As you know, it's been stayed, but... OSHA has recently come out and said that they're not going to enforce or otherwise administer the rule at this point. They came out and made a public point to, stop, to state this point. That doesn't mean they've rescinded it. They haven't eliminated the rule. And I have been hearing through some of my clients that there is word on the street that the rule is gone. The court case will likely eliminate it, but OSHA didn't come out and say they're eliminating it. This is still in place. They're simply taking a step back to allow courts to move forward to decide this matter. They are behind the scenes getting everything prepared. I can guarantee you that. This is going to be something that is a hot button topic. There's been increased staffing, all of these other fun aspects to government regulations and development that goes into this, but this is an important piece. And as I mentioned, this is for private employers with 100 or more employees and does not likely apply to the public sector. And I apologize, if you have questions of any kind, please ask them. I can't, and, and Joe, if you could monitor the chat just in case, I, I'm not sure if it can come up on the presenter mode, but let me know if anything comes through, would you? Will do, thanks. Thanks. Okay, basics. So under the rule, we have covered employers and we have covered employees. Covered employers have to either mandate the vaccine or require employees that aren't vaccinated to produce a verified negative test result on a weekly basis and wear face coverings in the workplace. Those are two requirements. So this doesn't mean that if you're, unva if you're unvaccinated, you just have to provide a test. You still have to wear face coverings throughout the process. So this isn't a vaccine or testing, it's a vaccine or testing and face masks. And I know that's a big issue for people, especially on the OSHA front in particular, with the, with the ability to do the job, interactions and distractions based on the mask, and frankly, just morale, communication, the ability to communicate with your employees, not being able to see people's sm smiling faces, all these other fun things, but it is a component that is, is an alternative to the vaccine. The rule also requires paid time off for vaccination and recovery. And we'll get into this a little bit more, but you can see that that doesn't include testing. And this, and just as a bit of background, ETS, these uh, emergency temporary standards, last only six months. If this is passed, you can be assured that this will continue into the future, but the rule itself only lasts six months, but you can Put your money on something continuing on if this is in fact passed. So who are covered employers? As I mentioned, they're private employers at this point, regardless of location over an over 100 employees. And you know sometimes you have different counting mechanisms based on the law that you're working with. For example, the, the Affordable Care Act talks about full-time equivalents, part-times aren't included, all that other stuff. This is a very, very basic count. If you have 100 individuals in your entity, your organization, you will be subject to this rule, assuming it passes. And I'll probably be saying that a lot, assuming it passes. But this includes the part-time. Independent contractors don't count. But if you've misclassified employees, if you have independent contractors that, for whatever reason, you have unemployment come through and they audit and find that these people actually should be employees, you make the change that will encompass those individuals as well. As I said, again, the White House wants to expand this to all employers, regardless of size. So throughout the presentation, I'm going to make mention on policy, development, strategy, 
it does apply to everybody. I've broken it down a little bit more for the pent for the potential that small employers aren't included, but this will apply to all employers, regardless of size, likely if we get a pass. Um, and we also have potential aggregation rules. If you have another entity or a sister company or any other related entity similar to the aggregation rules and under the Internal Revenue Code, but this one's more focused on how you handle your safety measures. If you coordinate between your sister companies based on maybe you have the same janitorial uh, crew between different facilities, maybe you have um, a joint safety, uh, safety protocol, anything like that would be evidence of a joint employer, I'm going to call it, um, or, you know, similar related entities that would qualify and combine to potentially make that large employer. Covered employees are basically everybody. There are some key exceptions, particularly it comes as actually a pretty good time for people that still have work from home measures in place. But the rule covers all employees unless that employee doesn't report to a workplace where other humans exist. <laughs> and that's kind of how the, the rule is phrased, ironically enough. Seems pretty robotic. But essentially, if you go into a workplace and you're the only person there and you're working on pipes or you're doing whatever it is by yourself, these requirements aren't in place. But if you have to, if you are anywhere within a room or a location with other humans, including customers. So if you have if you have a front desk receptionist or somebody like that, and they're the only person in the sales room, for example, doesn't matter. If they have customers coming in and out, that those employees are included. The work from home and remote employees are exempt from this rule. I get a lot of questions. Okay, great. Let's adjust all of these things to make this work. There are a few caveats to what work from home remote work actually means. And what that is, is if these people are truly 100% remote, they're, they're exempt from the, the count, they're exempt from the, the requirements of the mask, the vaccine, the testing. But if they come into work randomly, so one of my employers that I assist with has employees across the country, but they have a couple of key locations where employees come in every once in a while purely based on their needs. If sometimes they don't come in for two weeks, sometimes they don't come in for four weeks, or they come in every single day a certain week. Even on that variable schedule, those employees would be included in this count. Because if you think about it rationally or, or practically, you have employees that come in that aren't vaccinated, aren't complying with the OSHA rules or expectations with testing and face coverings, yet in they're at home for the first month, but then they come in a few times, that, and that creates that potential exposure, potential spread, and all of those other things that could potentially increase COVID spread. So that's another component where you truly need 100% work from home. And that's a key area when we get into the planning and strategy, who's actually work from home. Discuss it because if you have people that you've adjusted at this point because of COVID already, since for the last almost two years now, which is incredible to say, but if you have had made adjustments to have people work from home and it's working out, it may be worthwhile to have those people be more work from home on a permanent basis. I wouldn't go up on your entire workforce to try to make this not apply to you, but it is something to be cognizant of as that exemption is more widely applicable now than it ever has been because of the last year and a half of COVID. Lastly, exclusive outdoor work would also be exempt from this rule. Key deadlines. Uh, as Nick had mentioned earlier, we have a couple of very, very pressing time, time frames with this rule. The, the state order complicates things a little bit, but the decision could be issued at any time, as Nick's kind of relayed. There's a lot of uncertainty around it. And if it's passed at any juncture, past December 5th, this becomes immediately enforceable and all employers are subject to the rule. That's why we're pressing for preparation. That's why we want you to be proactive because if we do have a decision, you know, not necessarily, because let's say the Sixth Circuit agrees with OSHA, it's, they have the jurisdiction and the authority to do so, it's in place. Even if it's appealed, it's currently in place as it proceeds through the appellate process. 
if it gets denied, we have that until the Supreme Court, which inevitably it will, will continue towards. But as you can see, there's this is kind of a moving field goal post until we have a firm decision from likely the Supreme Court. But in any event, we need to be prepared on the off chance or the chance that it is passed at any stage because of these deadlines here that become immediately enforceable as we move forward. So as of December 1st, which is now only five days away, you, you're required to establish a policy on vaccination. And as, as I'll discuss further on, that's kind of our key piece that we can really take hold of at this point, talking about policy. Uh, the other thing on this, the other few things on December 5th, you need to establish vaccination status and obtain proof of vaccination status, create that roster of your employees, a spreadsheet that says, here's Danny Samando, he's vaccinated, he's got this proof, create that schedule or that roster that explains each and each and every person's um, vaccination status. If you have employees saying, I'm not giving you that, all that other fun stuff, and we'll talk about litigation in a little bit, but that is, that's also been exempted from some of these HIPAA rules and everything like that. In fact, I've recent, recently even seen um, some Wisconsin uh, OCI come down and say that it's exempt from some of those insurance protocols from providing the information. So we employers have full flexibility on requesting that information at this point. Um, the third thing is to afford employees leave for vaccination, face coverings required when indoors or in a vehicle with somebody else, and notifying employees of the requirements. And then by January 4th, you need to make sure that the testing obligations are set in stone and keep that protocol and procedure moving forward on that weekly basis requirement. Paid leave. Um, as I mentioned, we have some differentiation between paid leave for vaccination and recovery versus testing. The rule requires employers to provide to pay time off to obtain the vaccine and to recover. Employees get at least up to four hours if during the workday for to obtain a vaccine. This is separate and apart from any paid sick leave, vacation, any other potential offsetting big, um, paid time off opportunities. You, this is a four hour addition to any of that. The justification is that if they go through the two tests, the two vaccines and the ongoing boosters, it takes about an hour each time you do it, that would be an opportunity to utilize that. So it's up to four hours if used during the workday. If it's outside of the workday, there's no obligation for employers to provide paid time off. To recover from the side effects, it's a reasonable paid time off standard. What makes sense for somebody to recover? I got my booster yesterday. My wing's a little hurt, but I can continue on. But if people have some more, uh, more extreme reactions to it, allergies, whatever the case is, go through your typical um, uh, medical leave procedures or simply get confirmation from the employee that they have side effects and you know get explanations as to what those side effects might be. You don't wanna go down a disability inquiry procedure, but you also don't want employees to kind of abuse this to say, I got the vaccine, I'm gonna be out for two days. It's not how this works. They need to provide some explanation as to why they need more time. Um, there is a, you can cap this though. This is, and again, this comes to the policy considerations that we're gonna get into. Talk about in your internal teams, what's a reasonable amount of time and cap it there. If you wanna say employees are entitled to two days off or one day off after um, for recovery, cap it at that. It's a reasonable paid time off a standard. If you say an hour and a half, probably are gonna get a little bit of pushback on that but I'd say a day or two is more than reasonable to provide employees in, in order to recover. And as I mentioned previously, and probably for the fifth time now, there's no requirement for testing. This is really a push for the vaccine and the testing is an alternative. And then that's kind of the long and short of the testing um, as it relates to paid leave. But we do have other procedures around the testing requirements. They need to be FDA approved. You can, you can do the viral test. You cannot do the antibody tests. You can't do self-administered and self-read unless it's observed by employers. So another key point to consider is where and when are we doing these testings? 
I've had so, I've had some employers that are wanting to basically buy a bulk of tests themselves, depending on um, the burden it might be. If you have one or two employees taking the vaccination or excuse me, the testing route, then you have the opportunity to buy a bunch of tests and basically have employees take it then and there. That's an option. But if you have a ton of employees looking to focus more on the testing requirement, maybe set up a different system and strategy for getting those results on a weekly basis. And something that did come through from one of my contacts through insurance and some of the other rules that have come through, you're not required as an employer to cover cost of testing. You may have, and this is a big may, but it's very important that we take a closer look at this when you're, when you're figuring out the, pro the procedure and the practical aspects of getting people to go get tested. Is there a wage and hour requirement? Um, that is a very, very gray area at the moment. There are certain Wisconsin statutes that say you can't require testing um, in order to be an employee and that anything outside of that you have to pay them for because essentially it's, an, it's a condition of employment now to get vaccinated or to get tested. And as a condition of employment, employees that have to go get tested may need to be compensated and that could be compensable time. Now, that's why you need to strategize and think about how you want to administer the testing piece. Can you do it internally? Can you require employees to get it to you first thing Monday morning, having them take it over the weekend? But if that is the case, possibly that's a comp compensable time. Um, and it needs to be factored into their compensation, needs to be factored into potential overtime, all those are different aspects. So it's really something you wanna take a closer look at. And this is something that we're mon monitoring very closely. We have people focused primarily on wage and hour in our law firm and there'll be, um, there will be updates as far as whether or not that is a requirement. And I would at this point, uh, I would be conservative about it. If you have employees that need to go to Walgreens a half hour before their work, I would compensate them because it's way easier to do it that way. I know it's dollars out of your pocket. I understand that I'm not naive to it, but at the same time, doing it this way helps you in any future audits that anybody might come through and say, I should have gotten paid. Now we're talking about liquidated damages. We're talking about interest. We're talking about class action. Way more exposure if we do it this way rather than playing the conservative note and allowing employees to be compensated if they need testing. But you again can strategize around the best way to do that. What do we do about positive tests? You got to remove them immediately. Similar to how things were in COVID when you caught wind that somebody potentially had symptoms, you got them out of there. Similar process here, but in this circumstance, it's a little less intensive um, for the employee to return the needed negative test. Obviously we've heard, you know, false negatives or false positives, be wary of those, particularly on positive tests, get that negative, get a test right away. Um, and then meet the re meets the return to work criteria and CDC's isolation guidance. And that's honestly something that changes day to day. <laughs> so it could be seven days, it could be five, depending on your status, but definitely take a closer look at what those obligations are. And once again, no paid time off required in instances when employees test positive. You can provide them vacation in these instances. It's not necessarily a disciplinary action, but you do wanna, uh, you aren't required to provide any time off. It can be unpaid. You can provide them the allowance to utilize those offsets like vacation and PTO, but you aren't obligated in any form to pay employees that test positive. So we've talked a lot about those different aspects of testing. What happens if I have an employee that I don't wanna do either? They don't wanna get tested, they don't wanna get vaccinated. How do we approach this? We're gonna have a couple of different accommodation topics here. First is the medical. This is something that is highly, highly scrutinized. And frankly, there hasn't been, there's been maybe one or two examples I can even think of that are extreme in nature that would allow somebody to provide a request for a medical accommodation and have it be granted. More often than not, with the vaccine and the testing, medical accommodations really aren't in play. The employees can provide you the information and you can discuss it evaluate it, which you absolutely should do, undergo the interactive process, but still evaluate these and say, does this actually 
prohibit the employee from performing their job. Testing has very few medical consequences, vaccination, whole nother spectrum, but we have that testing alternative. There's a built-in accommodation process. So in instances when employees provide medical accommodations, receive it, evaluate it internally, set up a meeting, and unfortunately explain how that doesn't exactly fit the qualifications of an accommodation for employees to do the essential functions of their job. It's a very, very low, low opportunity for employees. Religious accommodations, we're also talking about employees that it doesn't, it doesn't mesh with their religious sincerely held beliefs. This is a very, very broad standard. I mean, I have a colleague that's done some really deep diving on this and he's actually found case law that shows that if you are vegan, that could potentially qualify as a religious exemption, a religious accommodation, um, or at least a religious sincerely held belief qualifying for an accommodation. Now, even though that standard's really broad, we're still talking about situations where it needs to provide um, a necessity to be outside of the requirements of this rule. Very, very low chance. We're talking about potential alternative work arrangements, but even still, how does your religious accommodation prohibit your ability, or how does this new rule, the requirement to get vaccinated and or tested and wear face coverings, limit your ability to, to practice your sincerely held belief? It's a high standard, even though we have a lot of breath as far as what can qualify as a sincerely held belief, this is still a very difficult standard to meet for employees. But again, I urge you to consider each and every request Go through those processes because under the um, under Title VII and under some of Wisconsin statutes, there is a separate cause of action for employees to bring against their employers for failure to engage in the interactive process. That is something that needs to be discussed. It can't be dismissed out of hand. Talk about it, internalize it, and have the conversation. But again, more often than not, this is not something that's going to qualify. Um, there are forms out on the web right now for both accommodations at this point to provide, always get proof of a proof, never take an employee's word that this, this is, doesn't, this doesn't mesh with my, my religious sincerely held beliefs, or this is opposed to my, um, my, I have heart conditions that doesn't allow me to take the testing. You need doctor's proof. You need uh, religious leaders know you need something to verify that this isn't something that employees are simply trying to get out of because the consequence isn't on the employees. It's on you, the employer that could potential, potentially face, you know, $14,000 penalties for failure to comply with these rules. Very aggressive penalties. Um, more than likely, it'll probably be more of a compliance correction process first rather than penalties off offhand, but it's still something that needs to be evaluated. And, and another aspect of this is an accommodation for personal beliefs. Um, you may have heard some of our colleagues up in the Valley with a presentation on some of this stuff. Um, and it's interesting that the EOC actually recognizes an accommodation for social, political, or economic philosophies, as well as mere personal preferences, even if they're not religious beliefs protected by Title VII. Again, most cases are dismissed in this circumstance. Um, and the, the, the few examples we do have are with regard to the flu vaccine mandates um, that have been dismissed in these cases here. And the real reason behind it is um, there's not enough to have a sincere opposition to vaccination. You have to have a religious belief that vaccination is unacceptable. So as you can see here, even based on personal beliefs, we always have this standard that just because you don't agree with the vaccine doesn't mean that you're exempt or that you can get out of it. This is a very strong authority mandatory rule that, need, that if enacted will require compliance. This isn't something that we can provide a piece of, employees can provide a piece of paper and get out of it. So it's very important that we strategize to get, to prepare for it. Um, determining employee vaccination status I'm going to go through these pretty quickly, these next ones, because I want to get the strategy and save time for, for questions. 
But to determine the, the status, you want to obtain and maintain records, you have to keep a roster. Keep it separate as a financial medical document. Um, don't keep it in their personnel files. That is something that could potentially be viewed as confidential. Um, and employees, if they request the information, which they can, should be kept separate from their personnel file. If there is no proof of vaccination, if employees do not want to provide it or really are adamant that they don't provide it, you consider them unvaccinated, which means you have to take the steps to provide masks and undergo weekly testing. Acceptable proof are the COVID cards, medical records, um, or any other immunization information provided by their healthcare provider or a pharmacy. So small employer considerations, as I suggested, this rule could be flexed to incorporate all small employers as well. So what's really need to be evaluated is what is everybody else doing? And I know it's kind of, we don't wanna be peer pressured into what our policies state, but we also don't wanna be the odd man out. We don't wanna become the guinea pig or the focal point of any OSHA audit or any other state considerations for determining whether or not employers are sufficiently caring and maintaining the safety of their employees. So what are we doing about vaccinations? Really consider some of these key points. Are we encouraging it or remaining neutral? Are we tracking if we're small employers? Are we trying to comply with some of the roster requirements that we just went over in that previous slide? But obviously, you know, Tom and Nick hit it right on the head. What happens if we force this? The labor market is an absolute disaster. It's very, very difficult for employers to find good work. It's an employee's market, which means that the employees are leaving. The turnover is high because people can go down the road and get paid $5 more because the competitor is so desperate that they've increased wage rates. And that's really across industry, sector, geographic scope. It's hitting everybody. So be wary of that. Um, but at the same time, if it fits your mission and all these other different things, that could create a competitive advantage. That's where you need to evaluate this to determine whether or not it's, it's, this is the correct action for you, despite not falling within the OSHA requirements. And again, a key point I can't under, undermine here, avoid information gathering on disabilities and religious accommodations. You absolutely have the right to require information to verify the, the legitimacy of their expectations, but don't go fact gathering. Don't go asking further and further questions. Contact legal counsel if you have any questions about that. It's a very sticky situation and employees in particular are very, very um, guarded around that type of information. So even if you ask a question about the disability or religious accommodation in order to sufficiently staff or appropriately accommodate the individual, I've had employees that have tried to file lawsuits because you can't do that. It's against HIPAA. You can't do that. It's against my rights, even well, even though it's well within your means. Talk to legal counsel to get information on that so that you're not going in and second guessing yourself as far as whether or not this information is prudent or not. Some additional things, and this is something we'll be talking about a little bit more. Develop the policy and enforce for everybody. Um, consider whether any uh, leaders in the organization will refuse to enforce the policy. If you have supervisors you know are adamantly opposed to some of these things, get ahead of them. Talk to them first and foremost. Talk about potential, um, because compliance is ongoing if people are taking tests. And if you have a supervisor that you've instilled um, authority to review this information and make sure they have it, but they don't care and they want you there regardless, even if you're not testing, get ahead of that. Talk to, create a different avenue for reporting. Talk to them for different, um, to make sure that they're compliant. Because again, this is an employee issue. I mean, I would certainly discipline that employee if they're missing those. But at the same time, the penalties are the employers to bear. They're not supervisors. They're not a manager's um, responsibilities. It's the employer. Designate a team to review the accommodation requests and the testing and all these different things. You know, it's, it's like a, a board where you have different subcommittees and things like that, it's important to create different uh, different committees to be responsible for this. This isn't a small undertaking. You know, if you have employees, 25, 50, 25 to 50 employees that choose testing instead, 
definitely monitor that. That needs to be evaluated, create a good setup and system to ensure you know when and where employees need to be in order to get those testing requirements complied with. And then provide leave on the, if you, if you choose to provide paid leave um, when required to obtain the vaccine. So small employers, large employers, a lot of these rules are generally applicable. But what I think that employers really need to focus on right now is that policy. Because I think that the policy sitting down with your leadership team and talking about what needs to be done and how creates the great blanket, the foundation for approaching or to, for um, handling anything that does come down through the course. Worst case scenario, you spend a couple hours developing a vaccine policy that doesn't need to be administered. Worst case scenario, you don't do anything and you're suddenly picking everything up during prime operating hours at the end of the year that could significantly um, hinder a lot of progress in operational development. So talk about the vaccine testing options, talk about what proof of vaccination is required and include it in your policy, and talk about the types of testing. I've, I've gone so far to recommend clients um, actually pick the type of testing they prefer. The reason being, you don't have employees coming up to you saying, I took this at-home test, I found it on Amazon, it was $2 for 50, I think that this is good, it, sells on, it says I'm okay. Even if they take that in front of you, you have no idea whether that's an FDA approved test or not. Include the specifics if you can. If you don't wanna be that specific, talk about the FDA approval. Um, the next thing, and as I briefly mentioned previously, Definitely, definitely, definitely educate, notify employees and leadership. This is a very contentious issue. And getting employees on board is not necessarily the issue here. It's making sure employees and, and managers and supervisors understand the rules and consequences. This is one of those things that, that the employer is not making a decision because they want this to be the case, at least not everybody. And so for those employers that are required and not selecting to do this on their own, this is a tough issue and a tough pill to swallow for a lot of people. So absolutely get people educated, notify them. And if you have the pushback, you always have the opportunity to say, this isn't necessarily something that I'm trying to push, but we have obligations under the law. And if Danny heard that you weren't going to be doing this, He'd be knocking on my door, mask in hand for each and every employee that didn't have, a didn't have a vaccine. So make sure that you're very, very upfront with your employees. And honestly, that's probably the most important factor because if employees aren't caught off guard by this and you kind of keep them in the loop, there's a lot less pushback rather than the surprise. Okay, everybody, starting Monday, you need vaccination or you need testing per week. It's a very difficult thing and an inconvenience a lot of people do not want to deal with. Move forward on determination vaccine, determining vaccination status. Um, this, these last few, you know, the first two main bullet points are things I think need to be done now. But things that need to be forecasted for, that need to be evaluated, are the vaccination status for each individual. I'd create the roster now. Not necessarily going to get every single person's vaccination status, but setting up the, the Excel spreadsheet or the Word document, the table, whatever it needs to be in order to basically, if this rule comes down, you go down the checking order and say, or the pecking order and say, is this person vaccinated? What do we have on them? Sending out those notifications to employees to say, here's how we're going to be approaching this. And even if something comes down from the Sixth Circuit where it says, this is being pushed to the Supreme Court, sending a note to your employees to say, this rule requires us to potentially request your vaccination status we will require it if this rule is passed. That way you don't, with proof, that way you don't have to surprise employees. Surprise on medical information and a vaccine that's as political as anything I've ever seen is a very difficult thing <laughs> to, to swallow. So make sure that you're upfront about it, but also create that PTO policy, put that into your vaccination policy. If you don't already have one for COVID, get on that, set up the tracking for COVID-19 tests. I think that's something you definitely need to do now, because if you have a lot of employees you expect to take the testing route, 
making sure you're compliant and that you can administer this on a weekly basis moving forward is extremely important. And that may be helped by creating committees design designated primarily for those purposes to follow and track, communicating with supervisors if they're gonna be on the hook for this, talking to them about all of the ins and outs to make sure that we have this information and it's um, accessible to everybody. In fact, finally, develop the plan for handling accommodation requests. A committee is not a bad idea. If you have one or two people that are responsible for it, get them trained up. Talk about, okay, here are some options for, here are some things that we need to evaluate. Walk through the interactive process, which if for those that aren't familiar, it's talking to the employee about what accommodations are available, documenting them, re reconnecting with them after a decision is made. That's really the cusp, the, um, the crux of the, uh, the interactive process. It's the conversation about what accommodations work. Discuss that with your employees. And these are the items that need to be addressed now, because as I mentioned from the on go, if this is passed, if this is, if this uh, Sixth Circuit okays this, grant eliminates the stay and lets this rule move forward. If it's after December 4th, this may be immediately effective. And we wanna be on our toes to make sure that we can comply with any requirements that we, that, that are required. I mean, this isn't, this isn't something where you make a small adjustment to your vacation policy. This is a drastic change for a lot of employers that needs to be very thought out and strategized around. And so that's what I have. I know I did receive a couple of questions and I do want to broach those first and foremost. Um, the first question I got was, what are, the, what are the litigation or discrimination opportunities employees have if an employer places a, a vaccination policy in, into place? Employees under the EEOC in the Equal Rights Division essentially always have an opportunity to, to sue. I mean, they can file a charge for basically anything. Whether it has merit is an entirely different conversation. Um, you will likely have to go through the process, but the EEOC and the ERD evaluate claims on their face. And if they satisfy, at least preliminarily, the basics of what a discrimination charge is, so for example, a disability, um, discrimination charge where let's say an employee refuses to do either the testing or vaccination and is terminated as a result of it. They could potentially say I was discriminated against because of my personal beliefs, religious beliefs, disability, depending on what the background is. They definitely have an opportunity. I can say that I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel totally uncomfortable arguing against that. That's a claim that is certainly defensible particularly if we have an OSHA mandate. So we always have that justification. And frankly, safety of the workplace is always a very strong business justification for implementing these strategies or these policies. And if employees do sue for them, that's always the first argument I lead with is we have to protect our people. So the risk is there. I can't say it's not, but the actual chance of a, of a claim proceeding for a, uh, excuse me, for a probable cause determination from the EEOC and potentially moving to state court and being successful is very low. The other question, um, are an employer's policies irrelevant as to an employee's rights under Title VII and the ADA? The answer is no. Even though employees have rights under those policies, under these, the, the, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and the Civil Rights Act, Title VII, those rights, the policies, as long as they're justified in, as long as there's a legitimate business justification, and these are legal terms of art, which is why I'm hiccuping and stuttering all over the place, but these are legal terms of art that allow employers to make legitimate policies in order to continue operations effectively, provide a safe workforce, um, whatever the case may be, the employer's policies, as long as they're legitimate, as long as they're non-discriminatory, and again, this is probably something that is the vaccination policy in and of itself discriminatory, because we have mandates from OSHA, it likely will not be, but even those rule, those statutes, 
are, are over can be overcome and defended against based on good policy, which again, brings back right to where I started. Creating a policy around this is extremely important to vet it out, strategize around and make sure that you have all of your um, ducks in a row. So with that, I think. And we did get one in the chat just now. Okay. Uh, if a company also qualifies as a federal contractor, is there something else they should be doing? And if the OSHA rule is overturned, do you see that this rule being overturned also? Uh, the federal contractor rule is in effect. It was an executive order and it's applicable now. So if you are a federal contractor, take a very close look at that because you may be already required to undergo the, the vaccination requirements. It is separate, but it's very, very similar. Um, but there's a little bit more authority behind that. Um, and Kurt, if you do have specific questions on that, feel free to give me a call on some of the requirements behind that rule. Um, I'd have to take a little closer look just to see some of the differentiating items behind it. But even if OSHA is overturned, I would be very surprised if the federal contractor rules are overturned as well. It just, you know, I, this is more Nick's field than mine, but I think it's still an area that the, the feds want this and they want it bad. So I would be very surprised unless there's legal authority to overturn it. Um, the White House or the, administ the Biden administration is not going to go out of their way to, to, re to rescind that, that executive order. Okay, so I, I think that I had my contact information up. If you need to talk, talk to Joe, to talk to Tom, to talk to Nick or I, absolutely let us know. And you know we'll be on top of this as far as whether or not this passes. I think that this is a very difficult, difficult thing to process. It's a difficult thing to prepare for, but I strongly urge your team to sit down and talk about some of these issues. Uh, if you have questions or even want Bob Reason to take a look at some of your policies for compliance, I know OSHA has a couple of uh, really important resources as far as notifying employees what needs to be notified. And even I think they might even have vaccine policies that you can customize, but even still be careful of those. Those are extremely conservative and may put you in a worse off situation than you need to be. So absolutely talk to your legal counsel before you start implementing that stuff, because there may be things in there that could hinder you unnecessarily. Nick or Tom, anything to add? No, not, nothing to add other than, uh, Joe, thanks for the opportunity this morning. Hopefully you all found that, that informative. Um, you know, it's one of those cases with the stay that, that this, um, you know, we, we don't want to be alarmist about it. Uh, you know, we, we need to see that legal process through, but at the same time, um, I, I know there's been a lot of questions, Joe, that you've been fielding from membership about what this means, you know, uh, how might you deal with it proactively, you know, what, what's coming down the pike. And so hopefully this helped answer some of those questions, but certainly if there's more, um, you direct them to Joe and Joe can get you in contact with us or, or, you know, talk with your current legal counsel. It's an important thing to, to keep your finger on the pulse on. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, thank you again, Dan, Nick, Tom. Um, and again, if, if anyone on the call has further questions that come up later, you all know how to get a hold of me. Um, send me an email, give me a call. And uh, if, if I can make a connection with uh, any of our presenters, I will. Uh, but thank you guys all again for attending. Anything else before we shut this down? Everybody good? From me. All right. Everybody have a great day. And uh, take care. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you.